some new faces too, which is, is really excellent. Thank you for making the time to be here. I hope you find it an enriching time. I'm, I'm sure you will. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Don Powers and I'm the principal of this august establishment, which, by the way, celebrates its 100th anniversary next year. No, that's not right. Maybe when I go over the maths, this, this, um, yeah, no, 40th. I knew I, <laughs> I knew I shouldn't have gone there. Uh, 40th anniversary. 140th anniversary. 140th anniversary. It's even better than 100. <laughs> so, um, good job, principals are not picked for their maths. Uh, so, uh, that's me and St. Barnabas. Great to have you here. Uh, we should pause uh, before we go any further to acknowledge that. Uh, we meet uh, on the uh, land of the Gaal people, who are the traditional custodians of, the, of uh, this land, uh, of the Adelaide Plains, and uh, we pay respect to their elders, past and present. Now, uh, the format for today, uh, with, with each presenter, there will be roughly 30 minutes or so of presentation, and then about 15 minutes of um, uh, opportunity for Q and A. Uh, uh, once we get to the um, overall sort of 45 minute mark, um, I will call uh, a halt uh, and we'll move on because later in the afternoon um, at 2.15 there is an important event which is afternoon tea. So it's important that we do allow a bit of time. Actually it is important because uh, you know we can have a cup of tea and there are some yummy things to eat. Um, but we can also chat with each other and get to know each other. So um, I think well, we have uh, three presenters today. Um, uh, Dr. Santosh Kumar is an ecology. Uh, he was to be presenting on um, how to share faith in multicultural societies. Um, unfortunately, uh, Santosh is quite ill. Uh, he uh, became ill on a visit to India, and he's had to stay in India until he recovers fully. And that's not the case at this point. So um, in place of Santosh, I'm very pleased to say that our academic dean, Dr. Kathy Thompson, uh, will be presenting on South Arts Soteriology and Presentation of Mystery, uh, so Preservation of Mystery. Um, and then after Kathy, we have uh, Dr. Joseph Chulman on the Decalogue in the Vision of Zechariah. And um, then after afternoon tea, uh, Dr. Damien Spessi on Citizenship and a New Identity conversion in the letter to the Philippians. So uh, a very interesting afternoon and I think without further ado I'll hand over to Cathy. last year at the Anzats Conference in Brisbane, and uh, it's called um, Karabat Soteriology and the Preservation of Mystery. The aims of the paper are as follows, that it will demonstrate the ways in which Karabat soteriological writing is discontinuous with the reform tradition in its reliance on the incarnation rather than the cross as the locus of atonement. The paper will also demonstrate that this soteriology avoids metaphysical categories in its conception and language tropes. And I'll argue that this makes this a soteriology intent on preserving mystery. I will argue also that this invests about soteriology with postmodern credentials which might secure it as influential within the development of soteriological discourses in the contemporary age. Why is an awareness of language tropes used by Carol Bart or any other theologian for that matter important? Well, I can only speak, from, speak about my own point of view on this. 
my interest in language and literature preceded my undergraduate theological studies. In fact, it preceded my life of faith at all. I'm confident to express this dual interest then in literature and or literary concerns and theology only because it's my belief that subjecting Christian texts or any texts at all really to a range of literary investigations enhances rather than detracts from an appreciation of the significance of those texts. So, for example, take the process of the development of the doctrine of atonement. We'll just look at a small snapshot of how that developed. Um, if we begin with a seminal atonement New Testament text, uh, we'd look at Romans 3, 21 to 26, and I'll uh, read the quote. But now, irrespective of law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He d Sorry, would you like to come right down to the front, Lachlan and um, John? his righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. What Paul was trying to say in the context of this passage is that Christ has justified Christian believers on account of their faith as opposed to their observance of the law. He then proposes a set of ideas about God that express the great giftedness of this soteriological reality. So he identifies Christ as Redeemer, Christ as a blood sacrifice, and he sees God as the God of the Passover, exercising divine forbearance. These are necessarily metaphorical ideas. They are not consistent with one another in any literal sense. And I'll just read you a paragraph from the um, paper. So these ideas are necessarily metaphorical because they are not consistent with one another in a literal sense. The idea of a redeemer socially contextualized portrays a person who paid to free a slave from an owner, while the idea of a sacrificial lamb whose blood was sprinkled to purify the temple and its occupants from the pollution of sin is a cultic, ritualistic entity. These ideas belong to separate spheres within the first century Near Eastern context. They also have a different character and mode of functioning from one another. One involves an empowered, influential individual, presumably with the wealth to afford to make redemption. The second is a sacrificial victim with no personal agency. But out of these metaphors have been drawn a whole range and of quite disparate socio soteriological concepts and so, redemption of a slave, as I said, the idea of freedom, liberation, sacrifice, sacrificial victim, purification, substitution, freedom from punishment, and justification by faith. A number of these ideas are not popular um, in modern and postmodern theology because um, some of them involve violence, 
Some involve injustice, the attribution of the sins of um, a certain group of people to another person. Uh, some involve um, what some people would claim is superstition, particularly those that refer to the devil as a, a, per, as a, as a personal um, being. My concern in this paper is not to interrogate those particular ideas um, from a, a postmodern point of view. Oh, sorry. Sorry. My concern is what happens necessarily to Paul's soteriological metaphors when they are translated into atonement models. So we're moving from metaphor to model. <clears throat> the first thing that happens to them is that they become literalized what was intended as a metaphorical or poetic appreciation of Christ's involvement in atonement, let's put it that way, becomes um, literalised uh, when, become, when the metaphor becomes a model. There's a transmutation of first-order metaphorical language into second-order literalisation. There's an implied reductionism in this. A metaphor has a life of its own. Uh, literal language has a life of its own too, but uh, it's more pegged down, somehow more concrete. And so there's an implied reductionism. <clears throat> then this literalization of a metaphorical sphere of ideas becomes totalized as one model is claimed as absolute. I'll just read another section from the, from the paper. This process of transmutation of first order metaphorical language into second order literalization is identified within modern and postmodern philosophy in the work of such writers as Nietzsche, Derrida, and George Steiner. These regard metaphor as the most suitable original language form for poetic, transcendental, religious, or theological discourse and maintain its ability to preserve mystery. Let's look for it now at Carol Black's Doctrine of Reconciliation, which is in some senses in discontinuity with the reform tradition. Carol Black issued Western atonement models as unsuitable components of the doctrine of reconciliation in the modern age. Early on, however, Bart identified a metaphor derived from Paul as pertinent for the development of his soteriology. However, this depended on a different translation of part of the same Romans passage where Christ is identified not as the sacrifice of atonement, but the place of atonement, or the mercy seat using Old Testament uh, terms. Some of you may be familiar with the work of uh, Jacob Milgram, who in the late 80s, 1990s, uh, wrote about this in his commentaries and popularized it to some extent. Bart reflected that the traditional atonement models failed to take seriously the connection between Christ's incarnation and atonement as they relied purely on the event of the cross. And um, Bard, of course, was referring back to some patristic writers like John of Damascus, Athanasius, and Irenaeus, um, who also um, had that idea that incarnation was bound up with uh, the whole uh, process of atonement, the whole activity of atonement. And uh, the quote is from Irenaeus. Atonement is not to be understood merely in terms of some external relation between our sins and Jesus Christ, but in terms of his incarnation penetration into the depths of our moral existence under the judgment of God. Bart's understanding of Christ as the locus or place later event of atonement was controversial as it diverged significantly from the soteriology of the Reformed tradition and there was more. Bart's um, early atonement theory um, had existentialist tendencies which he later issued, he later turned away from. 
these um, existentialist tendencies resided in the fact that atonement was the, the person who was saved, um, who, who um, <coughs> attained salvation, was going to be the locus of atonement rather than Christ. And so, um, and also atonement was apprehended through the intellect of the human person. And therefore, um, Bart was very suspicious of um, any atonement theories, even though he had propounded them earlier himself. He was very um, suspicious of those because of their existential uh, nature. Um, in Bart's early work, there was also what we might call a heuristic substructure of the cross, heuristic meaning, of course, um, educational instructive, um, so that the cross was meant to um, assist the individual in apprehending um, the atonement, apprehending their own salvation. And, um, and so it was seen to have a heuristic, uh, a heuristic uh, uh, meaning as well. However, in Bart's later work, he made a clear claim, claim to trans-historical realities within the being of the incarnate Christ. So not only was the incarnate Christ a symbol or a model or something that spoke of atonement or um, made atonement obvious to the human apprehension, within that incarnation of, uh, the two, of Christ of two natures, uh, divine and human, uh, Bart claimed that there were trans-historical realities that had an actual or real impact on humanity. The motif of covenant is not featured in Bach's early atonement theory, but it does form the bedrock for his later soteriology, which saw the incarnation as the fulfillment of the covenant. By 1926, Bart is clearly committed to equating the incarnation of the word with reconciliation through Christ. During this period, and somewhat unexpectedly, Bart reconstructs the place of sacrifice in his atonement schema, but not in the way we might think. He doesn't regard the sacrifice to have anything to do with any propitiation through the death of Christ. The sacrifice of Christ is to be posited on the humiliation of the Logos, which is necessitated in his assuming human nature. So that's where the, um, where the uh, sacrifice is located in Bart's later work. Although the incarnation has developed as the foundational idea for Bart's soteriological work by the end of the 1920s, there is yet, as yet no examination nor exploitation of the Chalcedonian framework for the incarnation which was foundational for his later doctrine of reconciliation, and which arguably was posited in concepts and language consistent with many elements of postmodern discourse. That's a terribly long sentence, and I'm going to give you a minute or two to have a look at it while I have a sip of water. Chalcedonian framework, I'm sure that none of you need reminding of this, but just in case, um, I've just got a quote there that sums it up. One and the same Christ, the only begotten Son and Lord, is to be confessed in two natures, and the triple dots refer, of course, to the nature of divinity and humanity, and therefore without any idea of a co-mixture of the two, or a change of the one into the other. And so that you know what I'm talking about from here on in, what is the emphasis of postmodern conceptualizations and language tropes? Because if I'm going to claim that Karl Barth is consistent or has consistency in his work with these particular um, <coughs> marks of postmodern discourse, we have to uh, know what they are. Within postmodern writing and criticism, there are general areas of concern to deconstruct four metaphysical presuppositions which um, 
are demonstrated to be inherently constituted by difference and fragmentation. Things that we felt were bedrock and sound in the past, ideas are now, um, are, seem to be inherently deconstructing themselves. The first one is, in many situations, causality, which is a classical Arist Aristotelian metaphysics. There's ontology, which is to do with being, and pre-modern claims of metaphysics that being is real and that signs imply presences came under scrutiny in um, postmodern thinking and uh, writing. Epistemology, um, humans feel justified in claiming God's existence and of knowing something about God. That too has come under scrutiny. Suspicion about the adequacy of language and other science systems to represent and convey the real. Here, a difference is understood to have lodged itself between what is represented through language and symbolic media and the nature of a thing in itself. And of course, the work of Jacques Derrida um, is notable in this respect. There are two clear movements in that the sacrificial atonement is linked not with the cross but with the humiliation to which the Lord God is subjected in his assumption of human life and his subjection to the vagaries of historical existence. This can be seen to include the event of the cross, but the event of the cross is not central to that in this context. Um, there's also an exploitation of the inner dynamic of the incarnation by presenting it dialectically in the language of the hypostatic union, which is part of the Chalcedonian formula. Okay? Um, the concept underlying the doctrine of the incarnation of at the Council of Chalcedon. So, Bart's incarnation as the locus of reconciliation uh, his foundational idea comes from Kierkegaard's infinite qualitative distinction between time and eternity, which implies there is a fundamental and quite unbridgeable gap, an ontological divide, a divide in the character of being between God and humanity. And that referred to this as a real dialectic. It's what he understands to be an underlying principle of our reality. His early dialectical method in the crisis theology of his early writing is one in which he creates a thesis, he regards the human condition, let's say, as the starting point. He then um, subjects that or confronts it with an antithesis, which is a confrontation by the proclamation of the word of God, um, leading to a synthesis of the two in the faith developed in the human being. And that's what I referred to before, who became the locus of soteriological realities. Um, so Bart was using a method similar to um, the kind of uh, dialectics that were used by both Hegel in the 18th century and uh, by uh, Karl Marx in his material dialecticism. Um, but notice he became uncomfortable with that because it implied the locus of soteriological realities was lodged within the human person instead of within Christ. So he eschewed this because of um, the basis of the ideas in existential philosophy. His mature dialectical theology is based on the real dialectic of the ontological difference between God and humanity exemplified in the incarnate Christ. So that real dialectic did not change for Bart. It is on this that Bart developed a network of soteriological ideas represented in his theo theology dialectically. So for example, the humiliation, there's the divine Christ humiliated, um, there's uh, the human nature in Christ exalted. So you've got two opposites happening at the same time there, the exaltation and the, um, the demeaning or the humiliation, and also uh, there is a, um, a dialectic uh, which is supported by humanity divinity. Does Bach's reference to the humiliation of the divine and the exaltation of the human in Christ contradict Chalcedon perhaps by suggesting a coalescence of the two natures in Christ 
Bach says a resounding no to this. He says, no, both the humiliation of the divine and the exaltation of the human are real enough, but the one does not cease to be divine in its humiliation, nor the other human in its exaltation. Bart maintains this infinite qualitative distinction in his atonement theory by using, uh, as well as using dialectic to maintain it. He also uses the trope of actualism. Actualism is found in the language of occurrence, event, and relationship, where these are implicated in self-transcending events. Actualism has a transformative function, but it does not involve a metaphysical collapse of the divine and human natures. It's to do with operations between God and humanity. Thus, in styling the incarnation the locus of atonement, Bach is not suggesting it is the place of metaphysical exchange, fusion or collapse, but a location where there is an exchange of events, such as the humiliation of divinity and the exaltation of humanity, or putting it differently, the binding of God and the setting free of humanity. Carol Bart diverted his soteriological work away from metaphysical characteristics in four clear respects. He omitted models and theories which could have constituted a totalised discourse. He diverged from a medieval use of sin and merit as metaphysical components in an economy of salvation. He avoided positing Christ's death as a cause of atonement and hence of salvation. He avoided positing a metaphysical distinction between God and humanity and then collapsing the difference, either ontologically by implying some exchange of essences between God and humanity, or epistemologically, where God is understood to be apprehended in the human intellect or consciousness by which human beings then become the locus for salvation realities that just underscores things that I've said before. Further, atonement is not an aspect of Christ's being, so that does not give it an ontology of its own. Atonement is found in the person of Christ as event. It is an actuality in Christ. Christ's identity per se can be said to be the locus of atonement only by being constituted by ongoing acts of humiliation, exaltation, um, binding and loosing, substitution, exchange, those sorts of ideas. Atonement therefore eventuates in Christ and in an ongoing way. It is not personified by him at any given point in time. Even when the dialectic is posed in terms of identity, son of God, the opposite son of man, Lord, servant, subject, object of righteousness, because here it is on the basis of the predicates of these subjects that a salvific exchange is claimed to be taking place. And the predicates, of course, are mainly the verb. It's the verb that follows the subject. That's the, that's the location where the event takes place in the doing rather than in the being. As with the cross, there is no causal implication for the incarnation as it is posited dialectically in Christ. The incarnation does not cause atonement in Bach's, in Bach's schema. It is atonement. It's a realization, an actualization of realities present in the eternal life and will of God, which is objectively present in the being of Christ and which can be realized in the subjectivity of the human person in their response to Christ through faith. That too is a long sentence, so just have another look at it. <laughs> <laughs>
Because the incarnation is the revelation of God to humanity, it's linked to Bach's conception of the analogia fidei, the rule of faith. In Reformed theology generally, the analogia fidei depends on the recognition that the incarnation is God's revelation of God's self to humanity and within the created order. It's because of this that human beings are understood to be able to speak of God at all. In Bach, analogia fidei is used as a theological device by which God's word or God's revelation is shown to evoke a human response. Through this, Bach argues, the incarnation accomplishes the election of humanity. It also accompanies the vocation and conversion of humanity. And I'll return to this just in a moment. I just want to um, finish off the, uh, what I'm saying about the cross, what Bart's saying really about the cross first. <coughs> the atoning significance of the cross is heavily <coughs> attenuated in Bart. read you a section again from the paper. <clears throat> from what has been presented here of Karabakh's soteriology, it's clear that the, the atoning significance of the cross is heavily attenuated. The cross is no longer seen as the place of atonement. Rather, the existence of the temporal Christ, consisting of both the divine and human, is now understood as the locus and event of atonement. The cross is no longer the place of atonement. The cross is understood as the fulfillment of the incarnation. The cross is concerned with the fulfillment of an atonement already realized. The cross is effective though. It removes the effects of misery, guilt, slavery, and rejection of humanity. It does not remove sin per se because Sin in Bach's schema has no reality whatsoever. The cross is understood by Bart to be um, the victory of God's righteousness, but not the locus of atonement. And there's a freedom necessity dialectic that plays out in Bart's view of election and vocation. Remember a moment ago I said that the incarnation, um, which, uh, event, which is eventuated in the, uh, sorry, which allows the atonement to be eventuated, um, that this causes election and vocation. Um, let's look at election first of all. As the unity of the divine and human natures is actualized in Christ, so the election of humanity is realized. <clears throat> this is posited in March on a dialectical tension between the necessity that God must act according to God's own revelation of God's nature <clears throat> with respect to salvation and the necessity that God must be free to act according to God's sovereign will. So um, God must act according to God's own nature, which is love. Um, and yet, um, we can't say that this means that God loves everyone into salvation as in a kind of a universe, universalism schema because God must also be free to act according to God's sovereign will. So God has freedom and human beings should not be dictating or attempting to dictate that by claiming uh, universalism. As the unity of the divine and human natures is actualized in Christ, so the conversion and vocation of humanity are realized too. Bart claims humanity has also to play out this dialectic in its temporal existence. We too must enter into this history and therefore conflict of his. In other words, human beings must decide in freedom to participate in that necessary faith. That might keep us all occupied intellectually for quite some time. We want to give that some thought. Here is elsewhere Bach's use of unresolved dialectic in his soteriological work resists the totalization of his discourse about salvation. And nearly at the end, I believe this paper has demonstrated that Bach's soteriology, through a combination of sheer determination and I would argue pure intuition, avoids literalization and totalization 
of the biblical witness to salvation through Christ. This suggests Bach's theological assertions and linguistic tropes indicate that his writing addresses many postmodern concerns about metaphysical presuppositions and content in the area of writing generally and in theological writing and writing on the atonement particularly. A number of years ago, when I completed the doctoral thesis on which much of this paper is based, it was probably enough to interrogate the above connection. Now it seems that some apprehension of its significance for personal faith, dare I say it, in the existential sphere, needs to be spelled out. I can only reflect on my own experience of discovering through Bart the patristic understanding of incarnation as the locus of atonement. This freed me from archaic and uncomfortable models which in places seemed to caricature God, personalise the devil, and focus on a baleful sinfulness of humanity whose existential sense of guilt could barely be touched by them. This approach to salvation relied on medieval stories that beggared belief, but that required absolute assent by faith, and in some expressions, rained down damnation to those in whom the faith has never been formed. I am enthralled by the notion that in Christ I am exalted, albeit sinful, happy to accept that this exaltation has at least not yet raised me to divine status. I'm even more encouraged to know that by the mystery of the ongoing actualistic exchange of Jesus' predicates with those of all humanity, there is hope, albeit not determination, of eternal communion for all with a loving and gracious God. So I went to go over. Thank you. I'm happy to give you. I'm happy to give everyone a copy of the paper who would like it. Yeah, well, that's a sort of okay. quotation to Okay, thanks, Margaret. Cass, could you just repeat the question back so people yes, back in here? Yes, certainly. That's a good idea. Thank you. George? Having dispensed with sin, why do you refuse the phrase, I'm exalted, albeit sinful? Well, I don't believe that I did, <clears throat> did think that the atonement um, dispenses with sin, but no, it dispenses. I it dispenses with the effects of sin, yeah. Um, I don't think Bart ever felt that uh, the atonement um, did away with sin in the re within our temporal reality. Ah, uh, that's, that's yeah. slightly different. Does that, yeah, that's does another, that make sense, George? Yeah. Yeah, another thing is you use the phrase self-actualising events. And so there when, could you give other instances of a self-actualising event? Um, Coming from uh, from Bart, um, I'm not anything. But I mean, if you can just give me that. Yeah, sure. Um, let me think about it. <laughs> um, it's 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 got to do with the fact that within Christ there are realities that are working together and that are taking place um, that have an impact on humanity. Okay, so. Within, so, as Bart suggests, within Christ, divinity is being humiliated, There's yes, a humi and humanity is being exalted, and the self-actualising uh, self event is the exaltation and um, the humiliation, um, because when those are affected, that allows for the opening up of atonement realities for human persons. Yeah, it's just that you used the plural, which implied that there were other self-actualising events, and I just wanted an example of another one. Oh, I think, um, I th I think um, any kind of uh, way in which Christ is seen to cause or bring about 
human redemption. So it's, sorry, I'll, I'll stop now. So it's mainly located in Christ. Located in Christ, okay, yes. that's enough. Oh, yeah, thank you. Oh, that, was okay. a, that was a good question, George. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I forgot to repeat your question. No, that's okay. okay. Any other questions or comments? Margaret, I'll just... Sure, uh, sure. Yeah, I'll come back to you just in a minute. Yes, Elise. I'm quite interested... So my exposure to Bart's theology has mainly been um, examining the latter stages of what he produced rather than the trajectory. And I'm just quite interested from a textual perspective um, and a process perspective how much he explicitly engaged with other thinkers in those early works or whether right from the get-go it was a fairly... Um, not, not an explicitly connected set of reflections in those early texts? How do they tend to function discursively? Okay, um, most of the work that I did was based on the Church Dogmatic, so Ch Church Dogmatics Forum. Um, and well, we all know what that writing is like. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a third of the page text and the rest of the page footnotes. Yeah. And so um, he did use a lot of patristic material uh, to back up his understanding. But he also interrogated uh, reformed theologians as well, the reformed tradition generally, mm -hmm. um, to... I think Feuerbach uh, didn't really leave with any alternative, potentially. So that's right, the, yeah. the historical situation that Bach found himself in is post all of these disruptions and transitions. And so to return back to that um, collaboration is really, I think, the, what's most masterfully about what rendered in what he contributed, that it's mm. so conciliatory after this experience of this top-down theology yes. and this extraction from that power dynamic to, to build back together. It's just gorgeous from a historical perspective. Yeah, and it's lovely. Um, but it's difficult to read, you know, you've got to keep at it because it's so intensely detailed in mm -hmm. every aspect. And every now and again, I, I, I remember the saying, did he really mean that? You know, <laughs> did he really mean that? And exactly what you're saying about liberative um, um, sort of understanding of human salvation mm -hmm. and through through Christ. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's quite yeah. a comprehensive emancipation that he renders. It's really yes. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah. Margaret, back to you. Sorry. Was, um, ontology. Um, he deconstructs it, and that's what ontology was being, and sort of what you are. I mean, but you're a human, God's God, thing like that. Um, and I don't know quite how he explains it, but it deconstructs it because of what it says it doesn't, it doesn't exist. We deconstruct it as well as way, isn't it? Mm. Um, I'm glad you asked. So Margaret's yeah. asking about um, whether that deconstructs actual ontology, ontology which is being itself. Um, so um, I'm not, not saying that Bart deconstructed ontology, um, but, but later on, postmodern, postmodernists deconstructed discourses that relied on being rather than doing. I think that's um, I, I'm sort of the easy way, to, an accessible way to put it. Um, Bart did not deconstruct ontology, but he moved away from um, theologies that depended on hard and fast statements about um, the ontology of God, so the being of God. So his atonement theory is not based on uh, the, the incarnational being of Christ so much as um, those events that I talked about, those actualistic events that exist in that tension. Thank you. We might have time for just one more question. It's Mark, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for the paper, Cathy. Uh, I was just curious. Um, one of your comments was that um, the atonement for Bart is already realised and the cross is the fulfilment of the atonement. Is that... That's, I've repeated that correctly? No, it's... Uh, the incarnation is the... Sorry. Um, yes, the cross is the fulfilment of the atonement. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious. Is, um, how does that... Like, how would Bart, would Bart think of the um, cross then as a necessary thing, or is it sort of, because if the atonement is already completed with the incarnation, is the cross sort of, um, and, yeah, how does that fit in in Bart's thought? I think Bart would answer that question dialectically, actually, right. Mark. I think what he would say is that um, the cross is a necessary thing that Christ has freely to choose <coughs> to participate with, and I think that's as far as we can go, actually.
you know, that there's, that there's the whole idea of um, necessity and freedom that is at the centre of how that looks at a lot of these um, historical events, including the cross, and he maintains that tension. And it's infuriating sometimes, you know, because you don't get a resolution to it. Thank you very Thank you much. Very much.